Well, good morning, and welcome to Sunday, August 23rd. We've been talking about the, um, the things in the Bible about the end times, and, you know, there's lots of fascinating and strange things that are talked about in Daniel, in Revelation, uh, things that Paul talked about, things that Jesus talked about. And so we're trying to make some sense of that, but a lot of what makes sense of that is our response to what we read and our response to what we hear. Because you and I can't be responsible for the craziness going on out there, but we can be responsible for not letting any craziness get in here and um, how we react. And so today we're going to look at a passage of scripture that used to really bother me. Because, you know, when people see what's going on today, you ever hear somebody say, well, I think it's a sign. And you say, well, um, a sign that means what? And they usually say, well, I think it's a sign that we are doomed because of, and then they label their favorite pet sin, basically. And so I kind of used to think that God was cruel and unfair. Now, I never really said that because if God was cruel and unfair, it wouldn't be safe to say it. But the truth is that... Um, God is more loving and more fair than you and I are. And so we need to reconcile that with what we see going on around us and what we think of that. And so I want to read for you a passage out of the book of Amos chapter 4 because it kind of exemplifies the issue that I was talking about. Because it would be kind of cruel if God just slapped you around for doing the wrong thing, but then he didn't tell you what the right thing was. You know, you'd guess and do it a little different, get slapped around some more, then you'd guess and do different, you know, or what kind of religious ritual am I forgetting to do that's making God so angry? And it would, I used to think that God was just really unfair in those sense. But then I, I, read Amos chapter 4, and to be quite honest, after I read Amos chapter 4, I, I thought, see, this is exactly what I'm talking about. God, how is this fair? And it's amazing how when you ask God questions, many times he gives you the answer. So the people in Amos, they liked doing religious stuff. They just weren't interested in having an actual relationship with God. So, reading Amos chapter 4, verses 4 through 13 says this, Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for that is what you love to do, declares the Sovereign Lord. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you have not turned to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink, Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards. I struck them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent plagues among you, as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword, along with your captured horses, I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel. And because I will do this to you, Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. He who forms the mountains creates the wind and reveals his thoughts to man. 
He who turns dawn to darkness and treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. Now I used to read that and think, how in the world are we supposed to know what he means by return to me? Is there a certain religious ritual, a sacrifice that they had forgotten about? So they tried doing this and bad stuff still happened and they tried doing that and bad stuff still happened. And I used to think, you know, that's kind of cruel that God would just leave them guessing while he takes shots at them. And then God opened my eyes to a very simple principle in that that helps take us out of that darkness and into his marvelous light. But I couldn't help but read that and start thinking about 2020, right? I got an email and there was this funny thing on uh, social media where somebody just kind of recounted in a funny way the first six months of 2020 and I just printed part of it for myself it says the year began with Australia on fire but then the USA and Iran almost went to war and we still don't know if I if the fires in Australia even went out people started talking about China taking extreme measures because of some outbreak in their country. But then people thought Prince Harry and Meghan leaving the royal family was a big deal. Then there was an impeachment trial and suddenly it was over. Kobe Bryant died and the UK left Europe. Then we started elections and the Iowa elections happened and nobody knew what the results of it was for days. President Trump halted all travel to China and Europe and everybody accused him of overreacting and being a racist. And then Italy suddenly closed and then France halted travel to there. People freaked out because Tom Hanks got COVID. Oh, we got to save Tom Hanks. And then he got better. All the schools, nail and hair salons closed, and suddenly Zoom became the communications hub of the world. The hardest commodities to find were hand sanitizer, face masks, ventilators for hospitals, and toilet paper. Toilet paper? My favorite term for this was Charmageddon. Everyone freaked out because word got out of North Korea that Kim Jong-un died. And then all of a sudden, he wasn't dead. The Pentagon, at this point, released videos of UFOs, but at that point, nobody cared. Are you kidding me? Air Force video of UFOs, and nobody cares because bigger stuff is happening around here. Some nations were hit with massive plagues of locusts, and the U.S. had an invasion of murder hornets. Murder hornets! People were publicly protesting with guns, but nobody got shot. And then racial protest erupted, and nobody was six feet apart, and they were not in crowds of ten people or less, and many of them weren't wearing mask, masks, but the spread of COVID was blamed on backyard barbecues and church gatherings. Sports were canceled. A giant asteroid barely missed the earth, and hardly anybody noticed. I, oh, yeah. Okay. Then scientists discovered giant structures beneath the Earth's surface, which some refer to as the blobs. Then scientists revealed that they had detected a radio signal from space that repeated every 16 days. And everybody begged, don't call them back. Don't send anything out there. We don't need any more. People then started tearing down statues and monuments because they thought that would help their neighbors more than actually feeding them or hiring them. And everyone on Facebook now thought they knew more than their doctor. A massive dust cloud from the Sahara Desert, kind of like the one in the movie The Mummy, reached all, all the way across the ocean and arrived at the United States. In Florida, they started talking about meth gators. The nation of Congo in Africa announced that their worst Ebola outbreak ever was finally over. And everybody's like, whoa, there was a worst Ebola outbreak ever? And then we found out about flying snakes. Flying snakes. And now 
All the cities are being destroyed by violence, and those cities are saying they need to get rid of their police department. I tell you, these are really crazy times. I mentioned several weeks ago about how things in Revelation start happening in Revelation chapter 6. And just to recount the first two verses, it, there's, it begins with um, what's affectionately called as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And there is a scroll in the hand of Jesus, and as he, there are seven seals on the scroll. And every time he takes off a seal in heaven, something on earth happens. So he takes off the first seal, and a voice says, Come, and the first rider of these four horsemen of the apocalypse rides out and it says he has a bow and he is given a crown and he goes out across the earth to conquer. Well, the word for bow in the Greek is a tox is toxin. So he has a toxin and he's given a corona and he goes out to conquer the earth. So check that one off. That one's done. Then in verse three, the second horseman says, come. And it says a rider on a fiery horse. We've seen lots of fire these days comes forth and it says he has a, a, a weapon, a, a sword, a blade, and he is given authority to take peace from the earth. To take peace from the earth so that people would kill each other. And it's not talking about wars, it's talking about neighbor against neighbor. And um, he's given the authority to take peace from the earth. Who are the peacemakers in our community? Law enforcement, they're called peace officers. And right now, authority is being given to take the peace officers from these cities that are plagued with violence. It's like they're throwing gasoline on that fire. So, crazy things are happening right now. And you start reading Revelation chapter 6, you start going, oh, okay, check that one off. That, that's... Uh, Interesting. The next one to come after that is crazy food prices, which makes sense if trucks are not willing to drive downtown to deliver food anymore because they're not protected by police from rioters. So, after a disaster, you hear about people saying, oh, it's a sign from God. Well, this phrase that gets told again and again throughout this section of Amos is this. I sent this trouble on you, yet you have not turned to me. What does that mean? God is not cruel. He's not going to leave you guessing. So what does it mean to turn to him? It's always good to let the Bible define the Bible. So let's look at some things that happened in the Bible. When Moses was leading the Israelites and he ran into trouble, he did not yell at the Israelites or tell them, go, sacrifice a goat. No, when they came to him rebelling or complaining or, or some plague broke out because of that, what they were doing, he would bow before God and ask him what the deal was. He returned to God. He went to God and said, okay, God, what's going on? And he humbled himself before God. When, the, when Joshua's armies were defeated in battle... He fell down before God and asked why. You see how it's a lot more simpler than trying to figure out what religious ritual did we forget? When King David faced threats or defeat, he went before God and asked God what to do. So, why would God let all these hardships and difficulties come our way? A couple of reasons. After a while, God just stops holding back the repercussions for our actions so that all of what we have done starts coming back on us because we didn't turn to him, return to him. How many of us never seem to find the time to pray and talk to God unless there's a problem? God allows problems to drive us back to himself many times. See, God wants to spend time talking to us. But if you never do, then he's got to stir things up just to get us to talk. And our lives always go better when we are regularly talking to God. And I'm not talking about how he rewards you for putting in the time. The relationship with God, a close relationship with Jesus, is its own reward. So it is out of love for us that God sometimes let hardships and difficulties drive us back to him. 
You think God is up there eight months into 2020 going, what else do I got to do to get you guys talking to me? And yet people get in their mind the craziest things for what it means to be righteous. And, and the, a godless generation believes being offended and hateful and violent is the best way to demonstrate your righteousness. It's nutty. So let me ask you this. What is your response? In the book of James, chapter 1, verse 2, James said this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Consider it pure joy. And he said that because it drives you back to your knees before God, which is the best place to be. So, when you face a difficulty, what's your first response? Ranting on social media? Do you blame Donald Trump or Gavin Newsom? Do you protest? Or do you take it to the Lord in prayer? And do you honestly believe that God takes your prayers into account and does something about it? Let me ask you this. When is your regular prayer time? Right now, out loud, wherever you're watching this, just say out loud when your regular prayer time is. If you don't have one, get a sticky note, get a calendar out, set an alarm on your phone or something. Start with just five minutes a day, or five, better yet, five minutes three times a day, like Daniel did. Have a prayer time to start taking these things to God, because there are some passages in, passages in Scripture that are just kind of frightening. If you turn to Ezekiel chapter 9, Jerusalem is violent. Horrible things are happening at that time in Ezekiel in Jerusalem. And God says he's going to bring an end to all the mess and all the horrible things that people are doing in Jerusalem. And what he does, and Ezekiel sees this in a vision, is he calls six angels with weapons in their hands and he says, go through the city and kill them all. Just take your weapon and go through the city and kill them all. But before they do, he calls one more angel, and it says that angel has a writing, a, a writing kit, something to write things down. And he says this in Ezekiel 9, Put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. So God first sends an angel to put a mark on all of the people in Jerusalem who grieve and lament, who go before God and they're like, God, this is horrible what's happening. Please do something about it. Put a mark on them. And then he tells the other six angels, go out and kill everybody except for those who have the mark. Really? Kill them all except for the ones who actually care and the ones who have enough faith to believe I will do something about it. He didn't talk about those who took the right political stance. He didn't talk about those who were angered and offended over what was going on. It was the ones who grieved and lamented. Because you can be angry and offended and no love whatsoever for others. But when you grieve and lament for the lost, it's a totally different deal. So what is the common statement throughout Amos chapter 4? God said, I sent this trouble on you, yet you have not returned to me. So when you read Revelation, here's an insider hint. Pay attention to how people should be responding. You'll read God did this, and then the people did that. And there are good examples, and there are bad examples. And maybe look at it, and instead of thinking, whew, what a bunch of idiots, learn from the idiots. Maybe you might be one of them if you don't start changing what you're doing. But look at them and say, wow, okay, I'm going to start doing that now. I'm not going to wait till get, things get real freaky. So pay attention to how people should be responding to God, and then do it. Don't think about it. Don't put it off. Just do it. An example of this is Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. And it says this, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues 
still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Okay, so go through that laundry list and realize here's a good idea of what not to do. So as a church, we want to help you in this. So this week, we have prepared Crosstown Community Church to be a house of prayer. Since we can't gather indoors as worshipers because the state does not allow that, what we are doing is opening up individual rooms. They've been redecorated to help you focus and for you to have a personal time of prayer. Maybe you're like, I would love to turn to God, but my house is noisy or my dogs won't leave me alone or whatever else or I just want to gather a church and pray. We want to help you with that. So we will have times that you can set up to make an appointment to come, have your own room, have your own time in prayer. We'll have some pens and notebooks if you want to write stuff down and we will leave you alone. We won't be chatting with you. It's something that we want to offer you as an individual. It won't be a place to come chat with me or get my advice. It's just you alone with God. But let me ask you this. Do you grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are happening? Are you actually taking the time to go before God? Or are you taking a stance, priding yourself in being right, and despising everybody else? Listen to what Jesus said. In the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 35, he said this, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Let me read it again. By this, everyone will know that you are Jesus' disciple, if you love one another. So let me put this rather bluntly. If you don't have love for one another, you are not a disciple of Jesus. You may call yourself a Christian. In other words, I voted for Jesus, but my day-to-day -day life has nothing to do with him. We talked a lot about that in last week's message. But if you don't have love for one another, you are not a disciple of Jesus. If your heart doesn't break for the lost, if you don't grieve and lament over the widespread deception and what is happening to people, then you don't love them. If you don't have love for one another, you are not a disciple of Jesus. Your thinking probably lines up more like the Pharisees that you read about in the Gospels. And Jesus said in Matthew 5.20, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's not about you taking the right stance. It's about how is your walk? Are you walking with Jesus? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Luke's gospel says, God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked and tells you to be the same. So how can your righteousness surpass that of the Pharisees? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself especially the angry and lost ones. Now, let me tell you about another struggle I used to have as an individual. What if you just don't care? I mean, how do you conjure up love? I know, uh, no, I still don't like them. You know, <laughs> how do you conjure up love for people? There's a few steps you can do, like getting to know them, but let me tell you the shortest way to gain love for others and gain love for the lost. Give God permission to break your heart for them. To break your heart for them the way his heart is broken for them. I was shocked how quickly God did that. That's a whole other story. But just give God permission to let you think with his mind and feel with his heart towards a lost and hurting generation. Because, really, what else does God have to do 
to get you to turn to him. I know a lot of you are um, watching these, like wanting to know these end times things. Like, I want to know when this is going to happen and should I run for the hills or flee to the ocean or hide in a cave? Actually, the biggest issue God has for you is fix your heart. Because if you don't fix your heart, you're going to run from Jesus when he shows up. Are you a follower of Jesus? Are you a disciple of Jesus? Do you have love for others? If you don't, do you want to have love for others? How many things have to go wrong before you will return to Jesus as he commanded you to do? Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, I thank you that you didn't call us to a complicated set of rituals. And Lord, you are not silent on this and just keep slapping us around until we get it right. But Lord, we thank you that you have a deep love for us. And Lord, you drag these things out because your word says you wish no one would be lost, but all would be saved and come to repentance. And so, Lord, we'd rather do that now than wait until the terrifying day when you come and the ungodly see you face to face. And so, Lord, we ask that you would change our hearts to the lost. Lord, as we hear about the craziness and nonsense that people are doing in our cities and across our country and around our world, may we adopt the prayer of Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Lord, we give you permission to break our heart for what breaks your heart. Because above all else, Lord, we want to be known as your disciples. And so, Lord, let the difficulties, let the trauma drive us back to you. That we would return to you. And that we may fix our eyes on Jesus. Because when our eyes are fixed on you, Lord Jesus, we can endure anything. Not only endure, but we can thrive during those times. Lord, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for your constant, relentless pursuit of us because you love us deeply. Lord, we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And God bless you.